Yeah. Okay. Great. So uh, let's spend a little time talking about ECG. So what we thought, what I thought we would do is, we're going to start really simple. Start at the basic concept of what an ECG is and how it's acquired and so on. What we're really looking at. Some of this is the premise that you want to do more than just um, execute a task. You don't want to understand what you're doing. Uh, and the second part of it is that um, it's kind of the basis on which um, uh, we'll build things. After this, Charlie's going to take over. So what I thought I would do is I'll give you a little bit of background briefing, a, a quick snapshot into the main condition, the sort of classic EKG of the conditions that we see and are most interested in in here and our inherited arrhythmia, cardiogenetics realm. Um, and then uh, we'll schedule the next meeting after that and maybe try to do this weekly so that um, the skill sets kind of uh, are, are in place a month from now. Uh, Brianna uh, provided a uh, cloud-based repository of information. We also got a couple more web tips yesterday, so we'll sort of compile a, a reading list, a resources list as well, uh, so people can learn about this. Uh, so I will say, having started uh, with ECG teaching 25 years ago, that uh, ECGs are uh, not at all intuitive. They, for the most part, are well suited to people who have a bit of an algebra, geometry, engineering, math kind of brain. And there are lots of people who aren't like that. Um, and there's a combination of sort of understanding the principles of what you're looking at and then the huge value of simple uh, practice and feedback and so on. So it's an interesting and complicated thing. Uh, and so, but let's start from the beginning. So uh, basic principles in terms of an introduction of what an ECG is. So an ECG is essentially a recording of the electrical signal of each, uh, each, of each heartbeat. Uh, and uh, the first thing has to do with what a lead is. So what a lead is, is it's looking for an electrical signal or current that goes from, uh, from one direction to the other. So if we take, for example, let's look here at my something here. If we look here at lead one, so if you see on the screen here to the right of the diagram is lead one. So lead one is looking for a current that goes from over on the left where the negative is on your left shoulder, if you like, and goes in the direction towards uh, from your, sorry, from your right shoulder to your left shoulder. So it's looking for a signal that goes in that direction, and then it will record any signal that comes towards it. That's a positive deflection. If an electrical signal goes away from it, it's a negative deflection. And what an EKG is, is basically 12 different cameras, if you like, that are looking at the electrical signal that happens with each heartbeat. And that's, that's divided into two kinds of leads. One kind of lead are, are what are called the limb leads. And the limb leads are ones where literally a, an electrode or a sticky is put on the right shoulder, on the left shoulder, and on the leg. That creates a trial. So those are the 12 leads in an EKG. If this seems a little um, too slow, don't worry, we'll move along. If it seems a little too fast, we'll iterate over this. You'll get to see this plenty of times. And by all means, stop me. Um, so... Here is uh, a little more precisely what we are looking at. So when you look at this and you've magnified this, what you see when you've magnified this is, first of all, this is labeled as lead one. So if you remember from the previous um, uh, um, diagram, lead one is essentially an electrode or camera that's sitting on your left shoulder saying, what signal is coming towards me from my right shoulder? So this is in the, if you like, uh, horizontally. And so if we, if we take lead one is that, that angle, okay, uh, and it's looking again from the signal that's coming towards the left shoulder, okay. The next thing is on the x-axis, if you think of this like a graph, this, the x-axis is time. So there's these big heavy lines and there's these tiny little thinner lines. So, and if you take five of these big heavy lines, that's one second long. That, if you do the math, that means each of these big boxes is, is 0.2 seconds or 200 milliseconds in duration. And each of these tiny little boxes is actually 40 milliseconds long. And that matters because, for instance, if the heart rate is 60, we would expect, expect each heartbeat to be five boxes apart or one second apart. 
So that's how we would, for instance, calculate how fast the heart rate is, is by determining how, how what the distance, if you like, or the time between two heartbeats. Okay, and then the next thing it does is illustrated up here, and that's, you'll see on all 12 ABCGs that it has this signal here, and this is what's called the calibration signal. And what this means is that the y-axis is actually the size or the amplitude uh, of the signal or current. And so ECGs on the left side have this calibration signal, and the purpose of that is what it's doing is it's sending out a one millivolt signal and it's making sure that the recording records that as one millivolt in amplitude. So again, if you look on the y-axis, the big boxes are half a millivolt each. So there's, this is 0.5 and this is one millivolt. And each of these little boxes is one tenth. So this is 0.1 millivolt, 0.3, et cetera, et cetera. So essentially what you're doing is you're getting a, you're getting over time, you're looking at the size of the signal as it's happening as you come across. So if you look at lead one, for example, if you were sitting there in the camera, you'd say, oh, hey, something's happening. This is cool. So for about, remember each of these little boxes was 40 milliseconds. So for about 80 milliseconds, we see something little happening and then things become quiet for about 100 milliseconds. And then all of a sudden this big thing comes along. It, it seems like it goes away for a second. So that's, remember negative means it's going away from where the camera is. So it goes away for, for a brief period of time, and then there's a big signal that comes towards it. And then the signal turns around and goes the other way, and in fact goes not only back to where it started, but even more negative or further away, and then comes back to, like, to what we would call the baseline. And then there's a quiet period for a while, and then there's a slow, big, positive signal that goes on for, you know, if you do the math on that, it's almost 200 milliseconds. And then we're back to the baseline until that cycle or process repeats itself. So what, again, this is, I'm on my left shoulder. I'm looking at, well, the signal that's coming towards me, it comes towards me for a little bit, things are quiet and it goes away and it comes towards me in a big way, comes back, comes, goes away again, and then comes back towards me and then and goes back to where it started. Then there's this big, thing that comes towards you, goes back away from you, and then goes back to baseline. So that's the, the principle of looking at the electrical signal from one camera angle. So then by convention, we then take those signals, that's, remember that's what lead one saw, we take those signals in and we've assigned names to them in that uh, electrical chart, if you like, of the cardiac um, signal. And so by convention, and this is old, and by now I've forgotten why they have the, this particular part of the alphabet to label it, but you have a P, Q, R, S, and T wave, okay? A question that can come up often is, um, do you always have a P wave? Sorry, do you always have a P wave? The short answer is usually, um, though if you have an abnormal rhythm, you can, you can have a different or absent P wave. Um, you may or may not have a Q wave in any lead. Um, you will always have an R wave and you will always have a T wave. So the Q and the S are dependent a bit on the vector, but the R and the T are always there. Um, and so then we have all of these different uh, waveform assignments in terms of labels. And then there are also intervals, which we'll go into shortly. So in the end, when you look at a 12, this is a 1280 kg of somebody who's healthy and, and otherwise well. When you look at that, then um, what you again, what you're going to see is remember in that frontal plane. So here's lead one that looks from your right to your left shoulder, lead two, uh, and lead three. So this is the th if you like the three um, different angles, and then these are the uh, other angles. So there's a total of six angles in the frontal plane. And I think it's a little beyond the scope of this to drill down into each of the particular vectors. Um, axis is not a big focus for us, uh, but that's that's well suited to your background reading. And then in the, in the precordial leads, the ones that sort of clock around the front of the heart, uh, from the front to the side of the heart, again, we have six different camera angles. So you end up with six versions of the same signal. Um, if you're interested in the technique, the machine records this constantly. So this is one long continuous event. And in fact, it's showing you this, but it actually has all 12 cameras are running at the same time. 
So if you go into the computer resource where these uh, things are acquired and stored, you can actually get each of these leads for the entire uh, 12 seconds of the EKG. And you can see there's sort of three seconds of each of the different um, uh, batch of leads. Um, questions so far? Okay, pretty quiet. Okay, so the normal sequence of, act of activation is illustrated here, um, and it's essentially sort of a top to bottom, right to left event. Um, so it starts off with uh, the uh, what's called the SA node or sinus node. So here in the top right part, kind of where blood enters from, a, from the head uh, and shoulders, um, there is something that's uh, sort of teardrop shaped that is called the sinus node. And so this is, if you like, like a lighthouse or a spark plug that fires, and that's what initiates the P wave or atrial activation. So then you get the sinus node fires, the atria depolarizes, uh, the impulse travels um, through the atrium down towards the AV node. So that's this green structure here. Um, and then the time it takes from when it starts or activates the atrium until it act, actually goes into the AV node, um, this is called the PR interval. Uh, the impulse then, uh, uh, then is uh, transmitted down the AV node into, this is the right bundle and this is the left bundle. This is the heart's conduction system. Uh, which then plugs into, if you like, the myocardium, and then and then the so first the atria fire, then the conduction happens, then the ventricles fire, and that's what produces the QRS complex. And then, in lay terms, we tell patients you know, the heart gets ready for the next heartbeat, or repolarization happens, which is essentially the reset and prepare uh, for the next cardiac cycle. So that's the the sequence of events. Um, again, the P wave represents atrial depolarization or atrial activation. So this is the period of time um, when the atria are being activated. If we, if you remember, if everything starts sort of on that right side, in a way, the first half of this is mostly the right atrium depolarizing. The second half is mostly the left atrium depolarizing. The middle is kind of when they're both up to it. Um, and the first part of it's mostly the right and the last part of it's mostly the left. So this is this captures the electrical activation of the atria. And then, uh, and, and again, there's all, if you look on the left side and, and you're going to have access to the PowerPoint slides, you'll, you'll be able to see um, and have access to the details around things like what the normal parameters are for amplitudes and durations and so on. So um, the next thing that we measure is, you remember, First, we activate the atria, and then the impulse gets to the AV node. So there's a period of time where it's, they think of it as the signal's kind of slowly working its way through the AV node, where nothing's being activated. So the, the signal goes back to being a nil signal or, or isoelectric line. And so we measure how long it takes to go from when the heartbeat starts, if you like, in the atrium and the sinus node, to how long it takes until that signal gets through to the ventricle and starts activating the ventricle. So that's the PR interval. Uh, and that PR interval includes both the, how long it takes to activate the, the, the atria as well as the conduction time down the AV node. And it is possible for those who are interested that some of the conduction through the AV node has already started during the P wave. So think of it, you know, if the right side is going here and then the left is starting to be activated, it could be the AV node that's get, getting its impulse starting in here. Um, and then there are some uh, disease conditions that you might have heard of something called Wolf Parkinson White or WPW, where patients actually have like a second AV node, in effect, a second connection, where they'll start to get ventricular activation early because they don't get the delay in the AV node. In fact, it goes it plugs directly into the ventricle. So next thing that happens is the QRS complex. So this is the summary, if you like, of all the vectors um, that are recorded when the electrical signal activates the whole myocardium, the, 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 the both ventricles. So if you think of this, if we go back to our lead one analogy, remember that the signal starts off by going away from you, then the big signal comes towards you, returns to baseline and actually goes away once again. And that whole, the whole duration of that sharp high amplitude uh, activation is called the QRS complex. And again, you, you, you often but don't always have a Q wave, you often but don't always have an S wave, but you always have, have an R wave. And again, 
if the, the duration of that, um, there are parameters for what's normal and abnormal. Um, Charlie will talk about bundle branch blocks, for example, where the duration is prolonged. Um, but that's the next part of it. Um, in terms of what, what makes up the components of the QRS, um, there are Q, you know, Q waves. Q waves, again, with activation going away can be normal. So in some leads, the first thing that happens is activation goes away from the signal. So a good example is if you are, if you are the AV node and you're plugging into the ventricle, the first thing that you do is you, in fact, activate the interventricular septum. And that activation, if you like, goes from the left to the right. So it goes away from lead one. So lead one, for instance, and the other leads that look over to the left, like AVL or like V5 and 6, often have what's called a normal Q wave in them, or what's called a septal Q. So the first little signal goes away, and then everything comes back towards the left, because most of the activation goes from the right to the left. So there can be normal Q waves, and there can be uh, Q waves that reflect an abnormal signal, if you like. Same thing with the R waves that you see. R waves can be normal in size, or they can be bigger or smaller than normal, which represent disease states. Those disease states have a broad range of explanations from problems with myocardium to the actual conduction system and so on. So the next uh, part of the impulse is the ST segment. So the ST segment is, again, after all the ventricles activated, Okay, so depolarization is complete. It's the beginning of the repolarization phase where you have a, you typically have a relatively isoelectric or flat segment um, while the, the ventricle is then beginning the repolarization process, uh, as I say, to kind of be ready for the next heartbeat or for their next depolarization. Um, we normally actually take a measurement of that ST segment, and if it deviates, and by deviates is whether it's up or down, it's higher uh, above or below the, the, the perceived isoelectric line. And, um, and that ST segment's usually measured 60 to 80 milliseconds from the J point. Um, and, uh, and then there are some definitions of normal, and ST segments are shifted in a number of different conditions. Conditions we'll be most interested in are things like early repolarization, uh, or Brugada, um, but also more common conditions like myocardial infarction and left ventricular hypertrophy and so on. Uh, next in line is the T wave. So the T wave is, the, again, is the summary of the signal that happens when, the, when the, there is repolarization. Most of the time the T wave goes in the, the same direction as the R wave. It has the same kind of uh, slower, more rounded uh, shape that the P wave does, as opposed to the sharp, rapid, high amplitude signal that you get from the QRS. Um, and it's usually half to a quarter of the amplitude of the R wave. And, um, and when it changes, particularly when it goes in the opposite direction of the R wave, there's often some disease state or abnormality that's going on. That's an explanation. So, for example, people with uh, acute coronary syndromes, people with cardiomyopathies, and so on, will get that kind of T wave inversion, an inversion meaning in the opposite direction of the R wave. And we will get to the point where we'll be looking at some examples just to illustrate some of this stuff. So, uh, the U waves, uh, so this is uh, an ECG actually I dug out this morning. Um, that has a very nice prominent U wave. So uh, again, the U wave is not particularly well understood. We don't actually pay much attention to it. Um, we think that that middle layer between the epicardium and endocardium, the outer and inner surface of the, of the cardiac muscle um, has its own electrical, if you like, characteristics and the activation of that and recovery of that tends to happen very late and can give those that small signal, which is uh, called the U wave. It's called that basically because of the alphabetical next in line. Um, it's, you see more of a U wave um, in, when the heart rate's slower. You see it in certain leads, like in the front of the chest, so V1, 2, and 3. It's more common in kids. Uh, it's more common in, in uh, athletic individuals. It's com more common when potassium levels are low and sometimes more evident in certain disease states like MI and uh, coronary spasm. So um, 
you know, a little anecdote that's pretty uh, a bit tangential, but one of the potentially 17 genetic forms of long QT called anderson will syndrome or long QT7 has uh, a prominent uh, U-wave as part of its electrocardiographic kind of signature. Um, and uh, at some point you might stumble on that. Okay, questions up at this point? Jason is with us. Hello, Jason. Hi, Jason. Okay, well, we'll assume you're being an observer. I'm just in the process. Of, we're just going through some basics of ECG interpretation. Um, okay, QT interval. Um, that's something that's obviously dear to our heart because one of the major uh, disease states that we study is long QT syndrome. Uh, and there is such a thing as long and short QT in the sense that if we're out of balance, if the QT is too long or too short, that can predispose us to ventricular arrhythmias. So the QT interval is something that we're measuring on the ECG, which is the combination of, of activation and recovery or depolarization and repolarization. Um, and I'll show you an example, but there's also nice online resources. I did a little three minute video um, I have a whole lecture on how to measure the QT interval and so on. I'll talk about that in a sec. But essentially what we're trying to do is capture activation and recovery. In lay terms, I tell patients until you, uh, how long it takes for your heart to get ready for the next heartbeat. Um, and in principle, one of the simple things, uh, a good thing to, to teach medical students is the QT interval should be less than half of the RR interval. So, uh, you know, the, the T wave should be done. Um, halfway to the next QRS complex. Uh, and um, prolongation is obviously potentially something genetic, which is our interest, but there are a number of different physiologic and drug causes for QT prolongation. These are typically transient. And so if you've been part of our clinic, you know that uh, we're often inquiring about some of these things as being things that are influencing the EKG observations. Okay, so Here's an example uh, of just a normal ECG, just to give you a little bit of context and so on. So um, again, this was something that I pulled up this morning and here's just dice 12 leads. Um, if you look at it um, and I'll walk you through. So first of all, remember, so the X axis here is time. The Y axis is the amplitude of the signal. Here's your one millivolt calibration signal, okay? It's actually a time calibrator too, if you're interested. So this, it also sends out a 200 millisecond, one millivolt impulse, and that kind of proves to you it's the right scale. And uh, and then again, we have 12 leads uh, from, if you like, 12 different cameras or 12 different angles of the electrical signal from the heart. Um, of those. Sorry about that. Of, of those 12 different signals, um, it will also um, give you a rhythm strip. So this on the bottom is a rhythm strip in lead two. Lead two often has a kind of a big signal because it looks at the, again, kind of right to left, top to bottom kind of angle when you think about that. And that's where the biggest forces are. So the reason they use it as a rhythm strip is because there's big signals there. And so that'll show you again what I was talking about, how it's actually recording all the leads all the time, and but only showing you three leads at a time plus a rhythm strip. So second thing you might notice if you remember that sequence of events is first we have the sinus node fires and the atrium is activated. So you have a P wave to begin each of these, what's called the, the, the each cardiac cycle, um, an isoelectric segment and a QRS and then an isoelectric segment, and then a T wave. So um, this is the sort of standard um, uh, 12 lead ECG. The other thing that uh, we won't go into in too much detail is, for example, how big, how long, um, how prominent each of these signals are is there's a whole range of normal as well as a, a, a pretty robust dialogue um, about uh, uh, what disease states cause and the range of how we detect them and so on. We'll have a bit of a focus on certain parameters because we're most interested in them because they are, relate to the patients and their, their predisposition to these genetic conditions. But that's the, that's the context. Okay. Um, 
Next is, this is what, Char- what Charlie's going to be getting to, and that is how you approach interpreting an ECG. And again, from the standpoint of just getting the skill sets to enter the data uh, that we need in our database, this is not primarily the point, but the whole idea is to have a basic um, skill set for reading ECGs that puts you in a better position to kind of understand and troubleshoot and read around and improve your skills that will make you better at doing the things we need for our database, but it's not just about that. So this is, this was my conventional way of thinking about this, which is, you know, you want to organize yourself into answering these questions. What is the heart rate or what's the rate? What is the rhythm? What is the axis? And that's um, the net vector of the heart, if you like. What are the intervals? And we, you know, heard me talk about QT plenty, uh, but what are the intervals? What, uh, are, what are the characteristics of the waves and the segments? And then there's another category for a few odds and ends to look for. And that kind of systematic approach allows you to look at an EKG and say, okay, hang on, I'll, I'll give you an example. Let's go back to this to say, okay, the rate. Well, you know, each of these, each of these QRS complexes looks like it's about five boxes apart. So that makes the heart rate about 60. Maybe it's a little more than five, so it's a little slower than 60, but that's the rate. And then the rhythm question is, okay, we have a P wave, an atrial activation before each of the QRS complexes. And you, you may not know this, if this is newer to you, but the P wave, both the appearance of it, its vector and its amplitude fit with the fact this is sinus rhythm. So the rate is 60, the rhythm is sinus. Um, the axis, when we're looking at what direction the sort of net signal is going in, and the axis here is normal. Um, and I won't go into detail about how that's calculated, but we know that that's normal. Then I look at the intervals and I measure, for instance, how long that, remember we measured the, the PR interval and the QRS interval and the QT intervals. So we look at those intervals and say, do they look nor- nor- short or long? And they all look normal in this situation. Uh, and then waveforms is the question, is the size and the nature of the signals look normal or abnormal? So are the QRSs in the right direction? <laughs> are they too big? Are they too small? Um, um, are there any changes, for instance, in the direction of the T wave? Does the T wave always mostly seem to go with the QRS or is there inversion? Uh, and those things are normal as well. So it's that kind of checklist approach which obviously takes lots of uh, exposure and experience to know, uh, but the discipline to keep yourself with a system helps you to interpret an ECG. So, okay. Um, so what I thought we'd close on uh, is a little bit of a, I feel like a, a tour of some of the key things we're looking for so that the people who are starting to get bored with the basics um, kind of know where we're headed. Uh, and part of this is what we are looking for when we are doing hero or cardiogenetics related um, ECG inquiry for some of these conditions and what their uh, trademarks are. So thought I would present a little bit of that. So, you know, here's an example. If you remember, we talked a bit about uh, long QT. Uh, so here's an example of a patient whose ECG shows a prolonged QT. So do you remember me saying that you know, one of the one of the basic rules is that the QT interval should be less than half the R interval. In other words, the T wave should be good and done by the time you get halfway. And if you look, if you look here, um, let's look over in lead two, for example. So here's a nice P wave, PR interval, little Q wave, big QRS, tiny little S wave, long ST segment and then a T wave. But when you look at it, that T wave is still going, you know, it's a, it, it takes till about 60% of that, of the time from one heartbeat to the next for the T wave to be complete. Um, and, and I'll show you a little bit about how we would go about measuring it, but the bottom line is here that the QT interval is quite long and that fits with the diagnosis of long QT. And then we go through the, the clinical process of asking the question, why is the QT so long? What's the context? Our interest is in the genetic components of this, but there are obviously other things that can make the QT long. So this is a nice example of long QT. So uh, this is something that's very rare. I've seen a handful of these in my career. Um, And this is short QT, where 
um, the QT is over so quickly, and that actually leaves the heart more vulnerable to arrhythmia. So if you notice here, it's, it sort of looks like it's chop chop as opposed to, if you remember, you have these this long isoelectric, you have an isoelectric segment or ST segment after the QRS, and in short QT that you see here, that ST segment is very, very short. Um, but this is an extremely rare uh, condition for people uh, interested. Um, short QT is again typically genetic when it's this short. They uh, tend to have their clinical events uh, during rest or during sleep. There's some overlap of short QT with some of the other conditions we're interested in like early repolarization and Brugada. Uh, and one of the reasons it's so rare is because it's actually a gain of function mutation. So in other words, the, the uh, genetic uh, event that happens that leads to this problem means that something works better or faster or more robustly than normal. And most genetic, if you like, um, changes lead to a loss of efficiency or function or something like that. Um, so that's why it's so rare, uh, but there is a plausible genetic explanation for it. Any questions so far? Okay. Next in line is CPVT. So this is another um, condition that we see. Um, I can tell you this is uh, the ECG of somebody named Trisha, who was actually, I met in my first year of work. And um, she had exercise related fainting episodes and was a young competitive basketball player. She was a teenager. And indeed, this is a normal EKG. And so this is one of the one of the traits is the EKG is not particularly helpful in CPVT and doesn't have any trademark findings. The rhythm when they have their clinical events is uh, is more of a hallmark, a classic signature called bidirectional ventricular tachycardia, but the EKG is normal. So if you see a normal EKG, that doesn't mean they don't have one of our genetic conditions, but it could mean they have CPVT. Uh, and here's ARVC. So uh, uh, ARVC, if you're unfamiliar, so arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy is an inherited form of cardiomyopathy that affects the right side of the heart predominantly. There's overlap with some conditions like it that can affect both ventricles. But the, uh, the key thing to remember in this situation is these conditions usually present with much more arrhythmia than with cardiomyopathy or heart function abnormality. Uh, and these conditions uh, sometimes have a fairly distinct EKG signature. So Brianna may be smiling because it, when we get a, an EKG that's formatted in what's called an XML format, our database has the ability to render an ECG for inspection and evaluation. And so this is the format that you see right in the center there. You see our PDG formatted kind of logo trademark, the little four colored um, uh, uh, plus sign. Um, and then there's some automated interpretation that goes into it. And so as, um, as Brianna and Lauren are aware, when you see this type of ECG, you can actually open up individual leads and take and look at a lead that occupies most of the screen and take measurements and so on. Uh, and so uh, we will get to the um, we will get to the uh, section in, during a different um, scheduled event where we we'll walk through how you use the database and our review system to be able to do um, ECG review and data entry and so on. So what's different here in ARVC is, again, if I look at these 12 leads, let's look, for instance, here in lead V3 at the bottom. So you see a nice P wave, isoelectric segment, a QRS complex, the ST segments, and now the ST segments are followed by a T wave that's inverted. Uh, and for context, for instance, the T wave is usually upright in all but maybe V1. V1, it's normal to have an inverted T wave, where you can, but V2 shouldn't be, and V3 definitely shouldn't be. So this is... In this instance, one of the key findings is that the T waves are inverted in V2 through all the way out to V5. And that's one of the major diagnostic criteria for, for ARVC. Um, the other thing that's a minor thing here, a lot of people are not quite so sure how useful it is, is that the QRS is a little delayed, a little longer than usual here. You see it mostly in V1. 
Um, and that can also be a sign of ARVC. So, uh, and here's Brugada. Now, some of you may be snickering, saying, "Why does he have uh, why does he have uh, beer bottles in front of his Brugada?" And, and the reason I say that is because um, Brugada, as a clinical condition, is really only diagnosed when the EKG looks like this at the top. So, this is type one. So this is real beer or real Brugada. That's what we actually worry about. Okay, and um, uh, and. Uh, a suggestion or concern about possible Brugada is when you see either a type 2 or a type 3. A type 2 is where you have ST segment elevation of 2 millimeters enough in this sort of saddle shape of the T wave. Um, but in fact, this is not something that's in and of, that's a concern in and of itself unless, ever, unless it converts to a type 1. So it's kind of like Bud Light. It's kind of pretending to be beer. So it's a, it's a sign of possible Brugada, but it's not the clinical diagnosis of Brugada. And type three is one where, again, if you can see here, this saddle stays well above the isoelectric line. And in a type three, in type three, the saddle comes down pretty close to the isoelectric line, essentially at it. And that's the, uh, that's the no alcohol beer for those people who like that certain analogy. I use the slide sometimes at talks, which is funny. It makes people sort of snicker. The interesting thing is a year later, it's the only thing they remember. Okay, so that's Brugada. Okay, so I just wanted to give you a little bit of an example of what we're going to get to when we get down to reading some of the more detailed things in terms of skill sets and so on. So this is a, a little excerpt from the How to Read the QT Intro, as an example. Um, and uh, so this is part of the reading materials that we have, and it, it goes into this uh, question of you know identifying what all those different waveforms are, and then techniques for how to measure it, and then how to calculate the corrected QT interval that's corrected for rate, uh, and then what to do or how, how to do your best when you're measuring it in something like atrial fibrillation where the heart, heart rate is irregular. And one of the key principles is to try to look for a big signal because it's easier to measure a big signal and it's probably more reliable as a way to measure it. Uh, the second is to take the longest value that you get. Uh, and most of the time, the, the uh, QT interval is measured in V2 and V5 because that's where the signal's biggest. And the T wave has that kind of, if you look here in the in, on this, um, right in the middle, has that kind of bell shape that makes it easier to, de to, to detect. So, uh, this is a nice paper from the British Heart Journal from the late 90s where, uh, where they described four different ways to measure the QT interval. Most people have no trouble uh, measuring the onset or the, where the Q is. It's basically the earliest ventricular activation, whether it's a Q or if you don't have a Q and R wave. Um, and that deflection is usually not hard to find. The real question is in a T wave, where does it end? And so uh, there's two general techniques. Um, one is essentially when the signal gets really small, you call that the end. That's called the threshold technique. So if you remember on the y-axis here, the, the y-axis represents how big the signal is or the altitude of the signal. So one argument is once it gets as low as this, it's like 0.1, one little tiny box, uh, or the same thing that you see here, then, it, then it's functionally over. So then you say, okay, that's the end of the T wave. When it's so low, it's less than one, millil one, one uh, millivolt. Um, that technique tends to be a, a little less reproducible or consistent to get within patients. And so what we favor is what's called the maximum slope technique. So that's why there's a red box around this one. So this is the idea that you take the T wave and you basically put a line down the slope of the T wave. And there's two different ways of doing it, but this is the one that we use most often. And, and in fact, our database, when you read EKGs, has a has a slope tool built into it and a caliper tool to measure how long it is and where to put the line. Uh, and this is the idea, you just put this line on the steepest part of the T wave and when that intercepts the isoelectric line, then we call that the end of the T wave. So this won't be the last time you see this. You can also see this illustrated um, again online in a narrated video and so on. But this is the kind of skill set we'll get to with the question, please enter the QT interval. Uh, what Brianna can explain to you is what we're doing now more and more with our ECG system and the HERO database is 
And we're importing the automated interpretation piece because some things the computer does or algorithm does, it does very reliably, like things like heart rate, for example. But some things like the QT interval need a reader to overread to make sure it's accurate or, or to eliminate the, the, uh, the automated read and enter something. So this is one skill set that will definitely need some comfort that you're, that's being done accurately because it's obviously important if we're running a national long QT database. So just a couple examples and then we'll wrap up. So the first example here is, and this is just a 1280 CG on a patient. The question is what's the QT interval or how would you measure it? And so um, here's an example where we take some of the leads. And so here's lead two. And, and I just took as an example, here's the V2. And so, the, you know, the onset of the deflection here on the left where it starts is pretty easy to tell. And then here's that maximum slope technique where you draw a line down the slope of the T wave and where that intersects the isoelectric line, we call that the end of the T wave. And then with calipers, then you can measure essentially the interval from the beginning to the end. This is the R interval or how long it takes uh, to the next QRS. And then you see the same thing, the same principle applies even when you know, you have a small signal here, but you still have a slope, you still have an isoelectric line. Um, in principle, though, this is not an ideal lead to measure the QT because the signal is so small. You want to, this is a, the upper one is a much more reliable way to measure the QT because there's a big enough signal to be sure you're measuring it accurately. Okay, and I think that's all for today. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry for the late start, but I think. Uh, we're on the right track and so on. And this is kind of fundamentals of the EKG and where we hope to get to in terms of the diagnoses we're interested in. So I'm going to stop share now. Uh